thing ah. about the technology issue. So I open up their minds to the fact that they can actually uh, participate in a global classroom. So it's not even just with students from you know their own classroom. If you wanted to, you could set these activities up so that uh, any you know, they're interacting with people from across the world. And I think as soon as students start realizing that, that in fact you know the whole world is their learning environment, uh, I think that just gives them a completely different perspective about what education is all about and what their experience should be about as well. And I think as we go on and think more about how we use these technologies we'll actually come to realize that you know we should actually be we should actually be offering these sorts of opportunities to our students so they do realize that there's just so much more out there yes I, I agree entirely with you Jeff I do have to confess to one limitation that I just because of growing old and getting gray have not been prepared to go over the equator because of the time zone differences. I deal with the time zone differences in Australia and locally. We do have some students enrolled in the course from um, that are, uh, are in the Northern Hemisphere, only small number, um, and I normally set an alternative assessment for them. That's interesting because some of them really, really want to participate in the debate. And I actually had three students in London and I thought, well, you know, I could put them together and I could put them in a team, but, you know, do I really want to deal with the time zone difference and all the rest of it and have them up in the middle of the night doing their debate? Having said that, I had one student that was insistent and he was in Dubai and he was prepared to get up at unusual times and he delivered the debate from D Dubai and he was fine. Another interesting point is I've had students actually in their workplace because their boss won't actually allow them to leave the work but will give them the time to just come on and deliver their debate. So I've had students sitting in their workplace with all the work world going on around behind them actually delivering their old debate um, uh, you know, over the internet. Just fantastic. It's just like, I think like the goodies, you know, you can do it anytime, anywhere, uh, anything basically. So I've just put up some comments there. You can see, you know, look, I'm putting up a, a rosy picture. There are some students that find it difficult, but overwhelmingly, the response is definitely positive, definitely positive. And, you know, the other thing is just the idea of debating. I find we don't have a debating society on campus at this university. I find it quite profound that there seems to be less and less of this going on. Um, and, you know, these students get very encouraged in that. Um, so I think we're nearly at, it, at an end because we've gone on a fair bit here. Um, so, you know, I, you can read these comments yourself. I think they bring out some of the support what's in the literature about socialised uh, learning, um, you know, active, engaged learning and um, being able to express their opinions, express their beliefs and feel it's in a safe environment. But, you know, they don't have evidence at, in a first year law. So what they're doing is they're learning to communicate in a formal rule constrained environment. It's constrained by time, it's constrained by rules. They're learning to think on their feet. So they're getting a taste of the sort of stuff that comes later in, in uh, the law degree. Um, in terms of motivating, you know, I don't really want it to look like a bragging thing, but it, I like to be enthusiastic and passionate and I like my students to be right. I get bored and so um, I find using the Socratic method, throwing out all these challenging things, we just have amazing uh, class discussions and get them really thinking about things. You don't get law students that come and go, I want to learn the law, what's the answer, what's the solution, there must be a result, I'll just apply it. You get them actually thinking about why is the law the way it is, is it just, is it fair, is there a rule of law? Um, and uh, that's what jurisprudence is all about. So what are the results? Everyone likes to know statistics and um, you know we, we've got a lot of that going on as every university probably has and that's the result as, as far as the pass rate goes but the student progression it's pretty good. Um, obviously I haven't got the retention rates up there and I haven't been able to access all of them there is some dropout early, but because it's a core course in the degree, I don't particularly worry because uh, they're going to have to come back and do it sometime. Uh, HDs are quite high. Uh, I have to be a bit careful about that, but I figure if I've set up the assessment appropriately, it's a criteria reference assessment, then uh, if they 
achieve what they achieve, then it's actually all working. So there's not a lot of failure in it. Um, and the last one there is evaluation. This is 2008, um, but it's pretty consistent across the years. And you'll see the, the red line is basically my teaching and it, it's um, above the school and the faculty and the university, which is the pink across the board. So I, I guess I put that up to encourage people who shy away from team assessment and think, now it is a lot of work, it is a lot of commitment, but there's also a lot of reward, there's a lot of positive uh, feedback and the students, I find if they're learning and you can see their growth and that's what I'm here for, if it's enjoyable. So um, I think that's for me, over and out, uh, uh, but for questions. So um, let's go to questions. Have we answered them all? <laughs> Peter? Yes, Jeff? Uh, sorry, it's a the question. Some people might want to do it. Jump in now. Um, do you th would you apply this sort of approach to other courses that you do? And do you think that this would be generally applicable? Or is it only applicable to particular types of activities that you want to do with students? Uh, another good question, and it's interesting in the context that we just had a whole school um, uh, three-hour meeting yesterday having mapped the graduate attributes across our curriculum. And so we've very much had this discussion and of course I'm probably a little unique. The teamwork is the only one at the moment in the course that there are in the whole program, but there are other lecturers that are looking towards it. I've said that as a first year subject, I want it to be duplicated as in there's got to be some other team assessment later in the course. We're in the third year of rolling out the degree, so we've got fourth year next year. Um, so we're hoping to have some more team work at the end. The students are asking for team work, um, which is probably a bit unusual. Um, and I obviously am having a large to say in how we do assessment in our degree to make it stand out and to make it different. Um, some for, falls on fertile ground and some not so fertile. So um, it's a work in progress and uh, but we have a wonderful head of school that is very much supportive of, of uh, achieving good outcomes in this area and looking and involved with the TLOs and looking at all of that. So um, it's quite an exciting environment and um, I wouldn't like it just to happen in one course. I don't think it can just happen in one course. It's, it's got to happen. And in fact, we do have um, people do a uh, oral uh, uh, bail application, I think it is, in criminal law. And a lot of those students come to me and say, look, if we hadn't done the oral bit in first year in, in uh, your course, we wouldn't have had the confidence that we did have in doing our presentation. And we also have in constitutional law another course where they can do um, uh, they can choose an assessment item that is uh, mooting. So, yep, it's filtering through the whole thing. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, yep. thanks, thanks for that. Any questions of Peter? Peter, anything else you want to say? Um, yeah, I guess I would like to just uh, follow up on one of the questions. Um, what a, a course established called the Digital Tools for Teaching and Learning Brilliantly course. It's a course available to everyone in the university and that's where those WIMBA sessions occur. I logged into that session, uh, that course uh, uh, this morning and there's actually um, two people uh, over the last couple of days have requested WIMBA orientation sessions uh, so they could prepare for their next uh, for their next course over the semester uh, in semester three over the summer. So once you start to use these tools in one course, they will start. To, students actually become an agent for change. So the students are actually requesting this in in future courses. Kelly, you've got a comment or question. How can we help you? It was about professional development for academic staff. So Pauline mentioned that other lecturers are looking at doing the same or maybe, um, I'm not sure if that means um, running debates in virtual classrooms or using WIMBA for other 
things, other activities. Um, but either way, I wondered about um, uh, is there just a small proportion of staff who are interested in doing it but don't know much about it or have they used WIMBA before and what kind of orientation or training um, do you do uh, for academic staff who are interested in trying it out? Um, well, I'll probably let Peter answer some of that question, but I'll just jump in and say that, um, and I should mention this, we have another staff member based at the Springfield campus that uses Second Life, and she uses that actually for an advocacy exercise in her criminal law um, subject. So I would say it is driven by the individual. The individual, and as I said at the beginning, I was driven by my pedagogical needs. And then I go, well, how? that's what I want to do. What will help me do that? And I look at technology to see what will help. And as I say, I feel like a Luddite and I have wonderful people like Peter that helps me do that. So you just access the resources to help you. Um, and uh, Aola, who uses Second Life, she also has other technical people here at the university that help her with that. Being a distant education university, we're probably, because we've been the longest distant education university, I think, we're probably a little bit ahead in having the technical support. And these people are absolutely essential and they're amazing people. Um, and so, yes, we have like lunch, brown bag lunch sessions in our learning and teaching where if we've got an issue with a new technology or something that we're using, we just get people to come and present to us, to help us out. So really it's driven by the individual wanting something and then asking for assistance with it. And then if there's a critical mass, we will get a presentation or something going. So Peter, did you want to add to that? 